You can turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2 this morning. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 2 this morning. In the middle of the night, I was driving home and I felt in my heart to minister on the concept of the new covenant. And I didn't know exactly how that that was going to go. And in the middle of the night while I was sleeping, the Lord gave me a dream. It was actually a friend of mine, Sean, standing in front of me saying, preach the covenant. Preach the covenant. Preach the covenant. And I woke up and I went and sat down and began to prepare a message and uh, I'll explain how the covenant ties into what we're going to be talking about this morning. But preach the covenant. You and I, you know what? It's not just my responsibility. And here's what I believe the Lord wants us to understand. It's not just my job to preach the covenant. It's not just Pastor Matt's job yeah. to preach the covenant. It's not just Naya's and Angie's responsibility or any other ministers in this room to preach the covenant. Every single yes. believer in this room, yes. you are a bearer of the yes. new covenant yes. and you are responsible yes. for telling the world about this covenant. Yes. yes. That we have entered into with, with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and with God our Father through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have a responsibility, my friends, to preach the covenant. Yeah. To preach the covenant. Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through 21. That's what we're going to be looking at this morning. Acts chapter 2, verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea and all you that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken of by Joel, by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in those days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. I will, listen, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. All flesh. I just got to say it again. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Are you flesh this morning? Yeah. Well, you're a candidate. <laughs> I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. I said your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And I don't I'm not going to spend any time in the sermon on this. But the young men dreaming dreams and the old, or, uh, your young men seeing visions and your old men dreaming dreams, it's not in the Greek, it's not connected. One or the other will do this and the other will do that. It's separated. So it's just entailing that this, the old and the young will dream dreams yes. and they'll have visions. Amen. All right. And then also understand that prophesying is not dependent on just the sons and the daughters of their children. It right. was all right. flesh. Amen. Okay. Hallelujah. All right. And on my servants and my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy the essence of all of these divisions, sons, daughters, young, old servants, handmaidens. It was just to let you know that it don't matter who you are. Amen. 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 Yeah. It don't matter who you are. You don't have to be a son or a daughter. You don't have to be old or young. You don't have to be rich. That's right. That's right. You can be the poorest of the poor. Listen, the gospel didn't come to make any of us rich in reality. That's right. On this on this end of the spectrum, the, there is a great reward ahead. I don't yeah. want you to lose sight of that, but I'm preaching before I preach. But I want you to understand what he's saying here. It's not making divisions and marking them out as strict. This person can do this, that person can do that, and no one else. It's just to let you know it don't matter who you are. Amen. All right? It don't matter who you are. And I will show wonders in the heaven above, signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire, vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I want to read it again. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This connection of the prophesying and the outpouring of the spirit is connected to this final verse and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. It's within that context that we need to understand the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and our responsibility in this life to prophesy. So I want to preach a message to you this morning entitled prophesying witnesses of the gospel. Amen. Prophesying witnesses of of the gospel. Yes. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we honor you today. 
Lord, your presence has been in this place. Your presence is here even now. And Lord, I call on that ministering spirit to come and fill me right now. To preach this glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. To prophesy, Lord, the covenant that you have entered into with humanity, Lord. The covenant, the deliverance, the exodus that brings life, Lord. Help me to express this as you've given it to me this morning. And Lord, I pray that you would give every person in this room a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That we would know the hope of his calling. That we would know the glory of the riches of the inheritance in the saints. And Lord, that we would understand this great power that has been directed to those of us who believe. And Lord, we're going to give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory for it today. In Jesus name we pray. And everybody said amen, amen. and amen. You know, before I get into uh, a story I'd like to relate to you, I just want to say thank you to Pastor Matt, Sister Abair for having us this morning. We love this place. Brother Robert, man, he's been a, a, a great friend every time we've come. And uh, I, I love this place. I'm not kidding. I love it. And he opened his pulpit up to me when I was, well, I'm still wet behind the ears, but when I was really wet behind the ears. <laughs> Still trying to dry some of that out. But, um, no, I'm thankful for you guys. We love this place. And what we have felt this morning is why I love this place. That's why I love this place. You want to know where God is moving? You go find where God is moving. And God is moving here. And I'm thankful for what we have felt in this place. And Angie ran out of here before I got to say this. But Angie and Naya... They showed up as Bible college students. I'd already been there, I think, a semester, maybe in a summer. And um, some people come and they're just a stick that gets tossed into the fire. Other people are blazing infernos that get tossed into that fire. And it just, woof. And I and Angie, they were, they were that and they still are that. Amen. And uh, I'm thankful for both of them and what the Lord has done. Amen. My wife is with me, Mary Beth. Um, <coughs> Y'all will probably hear her more. She's going to be preaching in Crossfire soon. She has, um, she's yeah. been teaching a, a couple of Bible classes at FCA. She's done several workshops at, uh, uh, international, at the International Youth Conference, now Family Camp uh, at Family Worship Center. And uh, man, she blesses me every time she ministers. Amen. Amen. And uh, I believe that the Lord has truly given her a gift to teach and to preach the gospel. But I love her for more than that. And uh, I'm thankful that she said yes, because it was really a 50-50 kind of thing. <laughs> and I definitely don't deserve this. But, you know, she's beautiful, and I'm thankful for her. And she loves you guys, too. We both say it all the time. Every time we get a chance to come, man, I'm glad we're going there. <laughs> so um, we love this place. Prophesying witnesses of the gospel. Just uh, a few years ago, before COVID hit, I was, um, the Lord had dealt with me about finding a way into high schools and college campuses. Now, some of my responsibilities today, including COVID, has made that quite difficult. Um, but we are still looking for ways to get into high school campuses and to get onto the campuses of different colleges and universities in our area. But as he dealt with me, I, I um, was just praying about it. I know he told me I could take you to the place where he told me to do it. Um, sitting out front outside of the Trotter building, which really belongs to Crossfire Youth Ministries. And in the name of Jesus, we're going to have it one day. Um, but right now, it's just an empty building. And honestly, I was there to pray that God would give us our building back. <laughs> and um, I believe one day he will. Um, we're waiting on that growth that we've been praying and believing God for. And one day we will have it. But I was sitting there praying about that. And the Lord just said, I want you to do everything you can. To get into the high school campuses around this area. And that's exactly what it was. Well, you know, what do you do? I don't have a clue. And I'm just, I'm just okay, Lord, are you going to have to open the door? That sounds like an impossibility to me. I don't know how that works. And um, a friend of mine, uh, a, an older gentleman, his name's Eric McCormick. Um, his daughter is a high school student at Denham Springs High School. And she had been really desiring for Pastor Gabe to be able to come uh, to Denham Springs High School and, and to uh, share at FCA, Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And um, so I, he connected me with a man, her dad, connected me to the man who was actually over FCA, Fellowship of Christian Athletes in the whole Louisiana area. Wow. Everything. So we got to sit down and have breakfast and I got to talk to him. He's a, uh, 
secret message of the cross adherent. <laughs> and uh, you got to understand, fellow FCA is a Baptist organization. They, they got to be very careful about what they say they believe. Um, and you've actually got to be very careful about how you express what you believe. Um, but God gives you wisdom. And as I was uh, meeting with him, there was no doubt he wanted us involved. So I uh, ended up going to a training little situation. And then we started doing that. I started going out and joining a group of Baptist youth pastors from the area. And I was amazed. I'm just going to be frank, okay? And this is not me railing on Baptists. It's not me railing. I believe that if you're born again, you're my brother and you're my sister in the Lord Jesus Christ, whether you understand everything that I understand or not. If you're born again, you're a part of me. Amen. You're my body. All right. And I love you. You're my brother. You're my sister. I do think there are some things you need to understand. But at the same time, it doesn't matter. You're born again. You're, part, you're my brother. You're my sister. So this is not a rail. And as I'm sitting there listening to them week after week, and I'm the new guy, so I got to wait. Week after week after week after week. And even to you, it kind of feels like, bro, what are you doing here? Just wasting your time. They're never going to give you an opportunity. You just need to quit. And week after week after week, there's two groups of students that would come in. The first group was filled with students from their churches. Filled with students. And I could understand ministering a message to them that would be encouraging or uplifting or a teaching moment that you would teach believers. But then I was, to my amazement, the next group that would come in, I can tell you right now, they were there for the pizza. <laughs> they were not there for the word. They were there for the pizza. All right. So they come for the pizza. And maybe they were all there for the pizza. Who knows? But um, there they were. And they, but they, this group, no doubt. I can tell you right now. It's, you know how, you know what it's like when you're around someone you know is not a believer. All right. And I'm, they're just not believers. And as I'm sitting there, here comes the message, the same message that they preached to a group of kids that they at least felt were saved. <clears throat> they delivered that to that same group of people. I was amazed. I thought, how on earth would you have this opportunity with kids that don't know Jesus Christ and you don't preach a salvation message? How can we do that? I was amazed by it, really uh, shocked. And I finally got an opportunity to stand up and preach. And I did what I felt the Lord had told me to do. He gave me a sanctification message to that group of students that were in the uh, first group. And then he gave me a salvation message to the second group. And as I preached to that second group and I gave an altar call, I allowed hands to be lifted up in the air. Almost every hand in that room was raised up. And I thought, dear Lord, this is what we've been going could you imagine, if, let me just, I'm not tooting my horn, but if I had stopped yeah. because I had been discouraged from staying and finally getting, but then thinking about it and every opportunity they had and they just let it go by. But I had one of them message me and say, bro, what you did this morning, I am so thankful for what you did. I just don't understand how you had such a response. Well, I know. I said, I know. You see, it has nothing to do with me. Pastor Matt was kind of tooting my horn a little bit earlier uh, today. And I'll be honest with you. He's much more intelligent than I am. <laughs> and I'll explain why. You see, as it regards teaching and preaching, I can take you to the place in the library of JSBC Bible College where I'm sitting in there about to have to teach for the very first time. And this was an accident. I got thrown into a class I didn't belong in as a freshman because they had changed up the curriculum in the middle of the summer. So now I had a couple of electives I could choose from. It was either the book of, I had the book of Romans, part one. I was, I could take Colossians, which I had heard was a mini Roman. So I was like, I want that too. And then there was Romans six, seven, and eight. I'm like, I'm just going to get full of an understanding of sanctification by faith, the message yeah. of the cross. Yeah. That's what I'm here to do. I want to know all about it. Yeah. So that's what I did. And as soon as we sit down in Brother Borg's class, uh, teaching Romans 6, 7, and 8, he said, I've decided to make this class a presentations class. 
And I'm sitting there with Ross Kibido and Mike Thomas and Josh Gentry and Jonathan Steele and a lot of upperclassmen who I don't want to preach in front of. No, thank you. <laughs> I don't want to preach in front of David Ward, let alone anybody else. Like I, I'm not interested in this. And I, he gave an out to anybody that didn't want to do it. You could write a paper. And I thought, that's what I'll do. But the Holy Spirit just wouldn't let me have it. And um, so I'm sitting down to prepare my very first <clears throat> teaching service. And I, I, I get a bunch of books that I had seen tacked on as sources to the other professor's notes. I just got all those books that I could find, sat them down beside me and just looked at it all and thought, I don't know what I'm doing. And this is what I did. I, I can, I, God hears me. I lifted my hands into heaven right there in the middle of that library. I said, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing. I need you to help. And the presence of God came all over me oh, yeah. top of my head to the soles of my feet it was so powerful that i had to stand up out of my seat and just start worshiping him yeah. just giving him glory and giving him honor magnifying his name i couldn't explain what was going on but i sat down and when it was all over i sat back down and i looked at all of that information i thought i know exactly what to do now you see that's not intellect that's a gift. That's a power. That's something that came to help me to fulfill the ministry that God was giving me to do. You see, the baptism with the Holy Spirit is not just about you and I getting goosebumps at church. It's not just about you and I speaking in other tongues or us getting it so that we can become a part of the group. That's not what this is all about. You see, it's connected to the prophesying of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That was the difference maker at that little Bible study at Denham Springs High School had nothing to do with me. Yes. Had absolutely nothing to do with yes. me. My God. Yes. I took a passage that God had laid on my heart and I began to declare it to that group of students. After asking the Holy Spirit to anoint it and to take it into the hearts and lives of those young people sitting yeah. there. And God pricked their heart. Yeah. Paris Reagan didn't do that. Yeah. God penetrated yeah. the callousness yeah. of their heart. Paris Reagan yeah. cannot do that. That's right. As a Holy Spirit, you know what happens when water hits rock? Do you know what happens? Slowly wears it away as water hits rock. Water hitting rock, water hitting rock, water hitting rock. You know, you might have some hard rocky stones in this place, but I'm telling you what happened in here earlier. That was water hitting some rock, yes, baby. Yes, water yes, hitting yes. rock, water hitting rock. You might be hard and stony right now, but you keep sitting here because as that water hits the rock, it's going to wear it away. And one day your heart will be a flesh pliable, something yes. God can work with. We need water hitting rock. That's what we need. We don't need intellect. We don't need well thought out exegetical preaching and teaching. And I'm not against exegetical preaching and teaching. Let's be faithful to the scriptures. Yes. You get that here for sure. I'll tell you that right now. But I'm not, it's not what it's all about. I just need a word from the Lord. That's what I need. I need a word from God. I need a word from God that will penetrate. That will be like water hitting rock. Yeah. You need water to hit that rock. Yes, Lord. We all have some rock yes. inside of us. We need the water to hit the rock. That's why we're here. Yes. But we got to have the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit. You start looking through the Gospels. And one thing that you and I begin to see is that Jesus' ministry is likened in many different ways to the ministry of Moses. In many different ways. The Gospels... And even the book of Acts really bears this out, that the ministry of Jesus Christ was likened in many ways, and I believe intentionally, to the ministry of Moses. And I'll give you a couple of examples in Luke. Luke takes Jesus up onto the Mount of Transfiguration. After having had him feeding hungry people in the midst of a wilderness, just think about it. Feeding hungry people in the midst of a wilderness. And he had just calmed a storm a few passages before as they were out on the water. So you see this ability of Christ, just like the ability of Moses, to control nature at the word of the Lord. And then you see him feeding those who are hungry through supernatural means. Jesus takes a few loaves of bread and feeds 5,000. It's a miracle. So in, in Luke, we're already seeing that in walks up onto the Mount of Transfiguration 
And he exposes the reality of who he is. Yeah. You see, that happened somewhere else. That happened on Mount Sinai when God's glory was revealed to Moses. But you want to know some of the differences here? See, Peter, James, and John could come up with Jesus, but nobody could even touch the side of the mountain with Moses because he died. But here comes disciples up the side of the mountain and Jesus exposes himself, reveals himself. He is God. That's what he's telling us. I am God. And here comes the law and the prophets. Yeah. Let me explain that. Here comes Moses and Elijah, a type of the law and a type of the prophets. Yeah. And you know what they start talking about? They start talking about, and this is the word that I, I love this so much. Luke actually uses this word. They begin in the King James, it says they began talking about his decease that he would accomplish in Jerusalem. You want to know what that word actually is? Exodus. <laughs> he actually uses the word Exodus, not dying, not the death that he will see, because he's not just dying when he goes to the cross of Calvary. This is a this is a greater than Exodus that's about to take place through the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. There's an Exodus coming. Amen. There's an Exodus coming. And you know what he was showing them all throughout his ministry? That's going to be I want you, I want you to know something. Miracles and signs and wonders, they're really not about preserving this temporal life. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I want you to think about that. Yeah. Because I've had to think about that. Right. Lazarus, right? We all love that story. Raised from the dead. Where's Lazarus today? Yeah. Yeah. He's buried somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Will God meet your needs? To give you comfort because he has compassion on you? Absolutely. Amen. Absolutely. He loves you. Every person that came to him was looking to have the quality of their life enhanced. I'm just telling you the truth. If they were sick, they were coming to be healed. They wanted their quality of life to be enhanced. But I want you to understand something. When Jesus was healing, when he was casting out demon spirits, when he was calling the dead men out of tombs, he was not just showing you that he can perform supernatural miracles to preserve this temporal life. He was showing you that there's a greater future ahead of you yeah, that's good. where there will be no sin. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Uh, you hear me? There will be no sin. There will be no demon spirits. There will be no devil. There will be no dead men. They will all rise. Oh, oh, come on now. The dead in Christ, they're going to rise. I'm telling you right now. Every dead man that's in Christ is coming up out of the tomb. That's a greater reality. I'm thankful for miracles today, but I, it doesn't really matter to me because there's a greater reality ahead of me. You want to know what gets me there? Death. Amen. This is comforting. This is encouraging because death is not a detriment to society if you're born again. That's right. Hello? Amen. I said death is not a detriment to society if you're born again. It's actually an exaltation. It's actually a furtherance. It's actually a promotion. Yes. <laughs> I'm not going backwards. If I die, I'm going forward. Yes. Death has no power over me. Yes. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Yes. Oh, grave, where yes. is your victory? Yes. Yes. Huh? <laughs> Listen, this the, the miracles that Jesus is doing is a sign of the exodus yes. that he's getting ready to accomplish at Jerusalem. That's going to provide for each and every one of us a not just goodness in this temporal life, but a future that is a whole lot yeah, yeah. better. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. I love Hallelujah. it. You know, I'm not I'm not moved. Well, when sickness is coming and they hit your body, it, it's terrible. But you know what? <laughs> Devil, do what you want. Do whatever it is you desire to do because I'm going to be with him one way or the other. Amen. This is just a reality, guys. There's a far greater reality that is ahead of us. And you know, this exodus that's coming, again, typifies... And it shows us that Jesus in the body of, of God, right? He's not just a man. He is God. He has come to this earth to live as God and as man. 
Yes. Emmanuel, God with us. Yes. All right, so he's God. Now, he is a much greater than Moses. He's not just a type of Moses. He just doesn't look like Moses. He's a much greater than Moses. Yes. And he's coming to the cross of Calvary to enter himself and whosoever will yes. into this great exodus yes. that's going to take place on the cross of Calvary. Matthew. Matthew does this better than anybody. As I think he wants us to understand something about the person of Jesus Christ. This man is the fulfillment of the Old Testament, but he's also the divine revelation in his own person of the new covenant that God is ready to cut with humanity. And he's the authoritative teacher yes. of that covenant. Yes. Yes. All right. As Moses, it was believed that Moses' father had a dream. This isn't in the Bible, but this is written all throughout Jewish literature. So it might not be biblical, but it is what the Jews believe. All right. Do you follow that Amen. thought? I'm not calling it Bible. I'm just saying the people that lived around the time of Jesus, they believed that this was true about Moses. It doesn't make it Bible. So I'm just letting you know. Amen. Caveat. All right. And they, they believed that his father had a dream that even though his wife was pregnant during a very difficult time, where Pharaoh was trying to kill the children of Israel, that he was a great deliverer in her womb and that his life would be preserved supernaturally. That's what the Jews believe. That's written in Josephus in Antiquities. They believe this. They also believe that there was a sage, a very wise man that served alongside of Pharaoh. And he advised Pharaoh that there is one coming among the Jews who is going to usurp your authority and he's going to take the children of Israel out of here. Again, this is written in antiquity, something the Jews believe. And you know what? Matthew says, you know what? Maybe it's Bible. Maybe it's just something that we've written down in tradition. But hey, here's the truth about Jesus Christ. His birth was supernaturally preserved by divine means. Yeah. By a dream that his father had. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. Hello? He's greater than Moses. All right. And you know what? There was, a, there might have been. A sage that gave wisdom that there was a deliverer being born into Egypt who would set the children of Israel free from Egyptian bondage. But here's an even better reality. Jesus was born during a time and wise men came and they told the king, hey, there's a great king that's been born among you. Can you tell us where he is? And you know what? Herod killed his own kids, killed his family, killed everybody. So he sure wasn't interested in another king being born among them. Right. So he starts killing all the kids in Bethlehem. Just like Moses. There's a much greater than Moses that's arrived. Moses flees out of Egypt. Jesus flees into Egypt. Yes. Hello? So that they can be protected from this slaughter that's coming to Bethlehem. And then, <laughs> I love it. Moses passes through the water into the wilderness. Jesus passes through the water into the wilderness. Yeah. There's a much greater than Moses that's arrived. I said there's a much greater than Moses that has arrived. And as uh, Jesus comes out of the wilderness in the power of the spirit, Moses comes out of the backside of a desert with the power of God in his hand. And everything that he says is going to happen. And listen, these were all judgments that Moses is pouring out upon Egypt. Jesus came much better. He starts delivering people from their sicknesses. Yeah. He starts preaching the kingdom of God. The reign of God has come for the poor. He starts delivering people from the power of demon possession. This is a greater exodus. This is a greater Moses. This is greater. This is much better. Amen. And then Moses parks Israel at Mount Sinai and takes them up because they got to learn something about the covenant. Matthew takes Jesus up the mountain. But the people follow him, you see, because what's going to happen in this new covenant is going to remove all of the barriers, all of the restricting laws in Moses's law that kept people from the presence of God. Right. 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 So instead of you can't touch the side of the mountain where you die, Jesus says, come on, come on up here with me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on up here with me as I teach you. There's a greater Moses. There's a greater Exodus. There's a greater covenant. That's being established in the person in the life of Jesus Christ. John. In John chapter 2. That first miracle. We always talk about. You know what that's about? Gee, he can turn all the situations around. 
There's more going on than that. Come on, brother. You see, Israel believed in a coming feast. They called it the Feast of, of, of Aged Wine. <laughs> and this was an end time messianic feast that was going to take place. And Jesus is present at this wedding and they just so happen to run out of wine. <laughs> and he said, what, what is it that, can you do something here? Well, my hour hasn't come yet. And his hour in John always speaks of what he'll do on Calvary every time, All right. All right. every single time. Yes. So my hour hasn't come yet. There is a time where I'll inaugurate that messianic feast, but it isn't now. But I'll give you a little picture of it. And now he says, why don't you bring to me the purification jars? Now, he could have asked for the wine vats. But he says, no, bring me the purification jars. He's not just turning the situation around. He's preaching the gospel. Right. Bring to me the purification jars. You see, there is a messianic feast of the aged wines and the rich meats that is coming. And the only way you're going to be able to get there is not through the purification rituals of the Jews. Amen. Right. It's not through Moses' law. It's going to be through the blood of yes. the grape. Yes. And Jesus says, this is the blood of yes. my new covenant. Yes. This do ye in remembrance of me. See, when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, the better covenant was inaugurated. And the only way, yes. hello, yes. the only way that you and I will be present <laughs> at that feast of aged wines mm. Is to come through the blood. Yeah. You're going to have to drink it. What, is, what does that mean? You're going to have to completely consume and digest it. Yeah. It just can't be that something you do on Sunday. It's got to be all up in you. Yes. I mean totally overtaking you. And doing something inside of you. Hallelujah. This is what it's going to be like. Hallelujah. You see everybody that came to that feast in Cana. Would have had to have washed their hands. In those purification jars, Jesus says you need to be clean to get into the feast, but it will be accomplished through the blood of the covenant yeah. that I'm cutting with you on the cross of Calvary. There's a greater than Moses. There's a greater deliverance that's coming. There is a greater covenant that I am cutting with humanity. Thank you, Jesus. A greater covenant. And whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Yes. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You see this ministry that Jesus began to both do and to teach is to be carried on through the body of Christ. Thank you, Jesus. You hear me? What Jesus started, and you know, I think I'm going to be frank with you. Why don't we see miracles? Why don't we see healings? Why don't we see demon spirits cast out of people? Why aren't we seeing a great harvest? Could it be that you and I aren't actually entering into it? Yeah, come on, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Let me ask you something. Are we waiting on an outpouring of the spirit that the Bible has told us about? Mm -hmm. That is to come? If there were supposed to be two outpourings, don't you think Azusa Street covered the second? Come on. Because we talk about the former and the latter rain. Well, I think Azusa Street likely covered the second. That's right. If there was a second to begin with. Right, right, right. That's good. I want you to hear me this morning. Absolutely everything that you and I need to accomplish the work yes. was given on the day of Pentecost. Amen. Paid for at Calvary, given to us on the day of Pentecost. Yes. We're not waiting on anything. That's right. That's right. Like, where are the miracles? Why are, where are the salvations? Could it be that you and I have lost our understanding of what it really means to be a part of the body of Christ and to do the work of the ministry? If you rely on Pastor Matt to bring in all the souls that need to be saved in Patterson and Morgan City, you're going to be waiting an eternity. Right. Yes. Right. We'll be waiting an eternity. That's right. if, 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 if Crossfire, if Family Worship Center relies on the pastoral staff and man, some mighty men preaching the gospel in Baton Rouge, right? right. I mean, some men of God, truly yeah. powerful preachers of the gospel. We've seen a man by the name of Brother Swagger who's done phenomenal things in bringing thousands and thousands, not millions of people into the kingdom of God. But I'm just here to be honest with you. If we don't, if our members don't take up the responsibility 
of winning the souls in their community will never grow. That's right. We won't go anywhere That's because it. it's not left. Listen, it's not left to the members of the clergy. It's not left to the fivefold ministry to do all of the work that needs to be Amen. done for the church in bringing souls in. You see, in the old covenant, there were only a few men that really got to enforce that covenant. The priests enforced the covenant. They didn't let anybody else in the temple. They didn't let anybody else do the sacrifices. They didn't let anybody else into the Holy of Holies. Only a few men got to do that. Only a few men got to sit on the throne as king. There were kings who would enforce the covenant in Israel. Only a few people got to do that. Only a few men were called to be prophets to Israel to enforce the covenant. Only a few men got to do that. But according to Acts chapter 2. Yes. Hey, I said according to Acts chapter 2. Remember, Jesus, greater than Moses. Yeah. Greater exodus. Greater deliverance coming. Greater covenant. We got a new covenant built on better promises. It's a final and eternal covenant. It's the covenant that you and I will live under until the day that we die. Guess who's supposed to enforce it? Yeah. I will pour out of my spirit. Upon all flesh. I said I will pour out of my spirit. Upon all flesh. You want to know who's supposed to enforce this covenant. And carry it to the ends of the earth. You are. I said you are. I said you are. Because we're all part of a royal priesthood today. We're all kings and priests. Under this covenant. Woo! And guess what he said. You're going to prophesy. Yes. We're kings, we're priests, and you know what else? We are prophets. Yeah. <clears throat> what do you mean by that? What do you mean I'm a prophet? What do you mean I'm supposed to prophesy? Most people primarily understand the context of prophesying uh, in the context of declaring the future. Now, reality is, you can. Because we know it. We do know what the future is. That in this end time harvest, there will be a separation of the wheat from the chaff. Through this outpouring of the spirit. And really that's talking about in Matthew and in Luke. That's really talking about the end time outpouring of the spirit for the means of bringing salvation to the earth that will divide humanity. Hear me. See, it will be the Holy Spirit in with fire. A lot of times that's misunderstood and misconstrued. He's talking about end time outpouring of the spirit that divides wheat from chaff. And the chaff, this isn't sanctification he's talking about. He's talking about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that will divide unbelievers from believers. It's not sanctification. I said that in a Bible study in my young adults Bible study a few weeks ago and, or a few months ago. And they it, I literally audible. <gasps> what? It, asked me about she was there. It was, they were like, what do you mean? I said, look at the context. He's not talking about sanctification here. It's not here. He's talking about when God pours his spirit out and it divides those who believe from those who don't yeah, believe. Man. Those who re, those who believe will receive the spirit. Those who don't believe will receive the fire. Come on. We know the future. So in a sense, you can declare the future. Because there is a place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth yes. that you and I, we don't want to go. But those who don't believe, that's a place where they will go. We do know the future. Yes. We can tell humanity about the future. But the primary responsibility of the prophet under the terms of the old covenant was to declare to Israel. They were God's prosecuting attorneys. And they were telling Israel, you have violated the covenant. Now it's time to repent and come back into relationship with God. If you don't repent, there's judgment. If you do repent, there's restoration Amen. and blessing. Yes. Yes. So guess what you and I are responsible for doing? We're declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ. Humanity has violated the moral fiber of all that God is. Yes. If you'll repent, if you will repent. 
then he will forgive you of all of your sins. He'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness and he will put his spirit. This is what he promised in Ezekiel. He said, I'll take the stony heart out of you. I'll put a heart of flesh inside of you. I'll take your spirit out and I'll put a new spirit within you and I'll do you even one better. I'll put another spirit inside of you. His spirit. So if you will repent, I will forgive you. I will cleanse you. And I will place my spirit down on the inside of you. If you'll repent. If you'll turn from your wicked and evil ways. Look, this is every person's responsibility. This is what this prophecy is all about. That there is an end time harvest that is coming. In Luke chapter 10, and there is a lot of, I wish I had more time. There is a lot of important information that needs to be stated about the continuity of Luke and the book of Acts. I believe that the book of Luke is a model that is being presented by Luke as to what the book of Acts should look like. And that the book of Acts is the standard for all church at all times and in every generation. How can you say that? This promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, even as many as the Lord your God shall call. That is what Peter said at the end of his sermon on the day of Pentecost. This promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, even as many as the Lord your God shall call. As long as there is God calling on people, there is the outpouring of the yeah. Spirit. Yeah. As long as there are people coming into relationship with Jesus Christ, there is a need for the infilling and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Yes. And again, there is something that needs to be said and a lot that needs to be said in reality about the continuity of Luke and Acts. Thank you, Jesus. It needs to be said because it is the premise. It is the theological basis for why we still believe in the baptism with the Holy Spirit today. Because it never ended. You know... <laughs> I got to stop. All right. Luke chapter 10, verse 42 or 1 through 24. All right. Luke 10, 1 through 24. It talks about Jesus sending out 72. Now, in the Masoretic text, which you don't care, it says 70. All right. There were 70 nations in Genesis chapter 10. In the Septuagint, which was the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it says that there were 72 nations. All right. The importance of the number doesn't matter. The importance of the number isn't important. What it's saying is, is it represented every single nation. So when Jesus sends out 72, he is sending out whether it should be 70 or 72. Again, doesn't matter. People argue, who cares? The importance of the fact is he's sending out one witness for every single nation. Wow. My God. One witness for every single nation. Because what's going to happen after he leaves is the gospel is not going to be able to just be carried by the 12. You see, in Luke, Jesus already sent the 12 out. But now he's got to send 72 because we're not just worried about Israel. 12 represented the restored Israel. God working and renewing Israel. But the 72... This is important yeah. because it's about every single nation. Yeah. And then if you go to the book of Acts at pivotal moments, when the church spreads into new areas and new geographic locations that Jesus said that it would. He said, you will be witnesses unto me into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world. At pivotal moments, it's not one of the 12 taking it there. Amen. Hear me. It's not one of the 12 taking it there. When the gospel spreads into Samaria, it's a Hellenized Jew by the name of Philip. Not one of the twelve. One of the deacons that was raised up among the Hellenists to take care of the issues regarding that section of the church. Yes. So it's a Hellenized Jew being sent into Samaria. Not one of the twelve. And then, now, when God wanted to show the nation of Israel, wanted to show the Jerusalem church that he was interested in the Gentiles, he sent Peter to Cornelius, but that was just one family. But when he would start spreading the gospel in its strongest point in the Gentile territory, guess who's doing that? We don't even know. The Bible just says that they were certain men 
of Cyprus and Cyrene. So at pivotal moments, God sends a witness who's not one of the original 12 to take the gospel into new territories. There's a witness for every nation. And hey, watch this. There's a witness for every family. There's a witness for every city. There's a witness for every state. There's a witness for every there's a witness for every section of every city. If we just start taking up the commission that's been given us. Think about it. Look at the witnesses in here. That's good. Look at what we've got in here. Come on. You want to see growth? Get out there and prophesy. That's you want to see growth? Get out there and declare. Because God, God's not satisfied. That's it. We're staying this way. That's right. He's not done yet. I said he's not done yet. I said he's not done yet. There's more. There's growth. There's, I declare it in the name of Jesus. I declare it in the name of Jesus. There is growth. Let's get out there and prophesy. Let's get out there and declare the covenant. Let's get out there and say, if you will repent, he will forgive you. And he will cleanse you. And he'll put his spirit inside of you. And you'll have a good future ahead of you. Yes. Yes. One last thought. One last thought. Just as Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness being tested, the disciples spent 40 days with the resurrected Christ. Proving and validating that he is alive. He is alive. He is alive. Is alive. And now they're ready. Hear me? Now they're ready. Because they've met. (laughs) Come on. The resurrected Jesus Christ. Jesus of Nazareth. The man they walked with. The man they watched heal. The man they watched perform the miracles of this great new exodus. As he was establishing this great new covenant. Because he is a much greater than Moses. Ah, it fires me up. And he is poor. He is ready. He's, you, they've met him. And now he is ready to pour his spirit out upon them. Hallelujah. Eight years ago, in the back of a little church in the middle of nowhere, Elkins, West Virginia, lost and running from God, but broken and destroyed by sin. Sin eats away at the desire for the existence of life. Sin destroys the desire to want to live in this miserable existence. Well, I don't know about that, Paris. I see rich people living it up and having a great time. You're not with them as they lay their head down on the pillow at night and weep because all of their riches and all of their wealth and all of their power, it don't mean nothing. Sin eats away at the desire to even want to exist any longer. And as I was in that place, not knowing what to do, there were times drunk, sitting out in front of the baseball field at our college, looking at a tree, thinking, if I can get this car fast enough, I could smoke that tree and end it all. This is the place I'm in. This is where sin had brought me to. And I walk into that little church in the middle of nowhere, Elkins, West Virginia. And that morning, I came into contact with the resurrected Jesus Christ. On that day, I became very well acquainted with the reality that he is alive. I said he is alive. He is alive. alive. Do I have some born again people in this room this morning? Have you met the resurrected Jesus Christ? I'm telling you right now, if you're born again, you know you have. You know you've come in contact with that man who has the nail prints in his hands. The one whose side they pierced on the cross of Calvary. The one who they took a hammer and beat the crown of thorns down into his head. You come in contact with that man because the grave could not hold him. It had absolutely no power over him. 
And when it was time, I said he got up. I mean, he got up. And he walked out of that grave. And he dropped off a few witnesses with him. Because he led captivity captive. I said there's a greater exodus. There's a greater exodus. He didn't just exit uh, sin. He didn't just exit demon possession. He exited death. He is alive. Woo! I said he's alive this morning. You want to know what that means? You've got a story to tell. That's what that means. You have a story to tell. He is alive. I said he's alive. He's alive. And you know what you need? You need the power of the Holy Spirit to tell it. That's what you need. You need the anointing of the Holy Spirit to come on upon you. Not just today, but tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Listen to me. We make the baptism of the Holy Spirit something that it isn't. We make it this end all, be, this be all end all. I usually flip that around. This be all end all. And if I get it, I got everything that I need. My friends, that's wrong. Because in Acts chapter 4, they needed a refill. Yeah. That's it. That's it. That's it. And every time they stood up to preach over and over and over again through the books of, book of Acts, it says, and being filled with the Holy Spirit, they began to preach. Yeah. Hey, you and I need the infilling of the Holy Spirit, not just one particular day. We need it day yeah. after day after day after day yeah. after day. And then day after day after day after day after day. I need him right now. I need him in the morning when I wake up. I need him in the night when I go to sleep. I need him the next day and the next day and the next day. I need the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Because I got a story to tell. A story that transforms hearts and lives. A story that turns lives, broken lives around. I said I got a story to tell. You got a story to tell. Singers and musicians, make your way back. I said you got a story to tell. I said you got a story to tell this morning. You got a story to tell this morning. And you need the Holy Spirit to tell it. You don't just need to speak in tongues this morning. You need the power. Yeah. I said you need the power. I said you need the power. I said you need the power. I said you need the power of the Holy Spirit. And you need to step out in faith and walk. You need to step out in faith and prophesy. You need to step out in faith and witness. Tell that person you've been struggling with to talk to. I, God fill me right now. And you begin to tell them. This is what we got to have. This is what we got to have. This is what Crossfire Youth Ministry needs. This is what Jimmy Swagger Bible College needs. This is what Family Worship Center needs. It's what the world needs. It's what this church here needs. We gotta have it. We gotta have it. We don't just need to speak in tongues. Listen, that's the initial physical evidence of being baptized with the Holy Spirit. Think about that. Initial physical evidence. It's only the first fruits. It's not the proof. You want to know the proof? Spirit-empowered witnessing of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is what we've got to have. God wants His church to walk in power. And He's given us everything we need to do it. Everything, everything, everything. I'm not waiting on anything. You're not waiting on anything. He's here. We talked about it in worship. He's here right now. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. If you need to be filled today, come. If you need a filling of the Spirit this morning, come. Come and be filled this morning. I'm not even talking about just the baptism. I'm saying if it's time to be refilled, we need to get down here and let Him touch you. These altars are open. You come and be filled afresh with the Spirit and with His presence. We've got to have more. We've got to have more today. We've got to have more today in the name of Jesus. Whatever you call it.